Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is. Oh, so please let me know when can I start? Yeah, I think if everyone else can just follow from the time, maybe if this like this can be your start, a start time. Okay, sure. So, assalamu alaikum everyone. Hope you are doing well. Um, I'll be sharing my research, which was on effective campaigns to stop littering. Uh, so as you all know, solid waste is a huge problem around the world. Um, and I was looking at uh, the figures for Pakistan, so around 55,000 tons of solid waste is produced in Pakistan in just a single day. So to collect it and to dispose it off properly is a huge problem, especially when a lot of it is being um, thrown out on the streets or going into waterways. Um, it's not being recycled properly. Um, and so we need to train people how they can stop throwing litter around the place and rather they should put it in proper collection points like uh, waste bins. Uh, a lot of campaigns around the world have tried to do with you guys. Uh, but first, I think it's important to answer the question, why do people litter? So research by um, psychologists have found that there are three main reasons for this. Number one is convenience. It's really convenient. You just throw a piece of trash right there and then, rather than to keep it with you and throw it at a proper disposal site. Number two is lack of ownership. So when it comes to public places, people don't take ownership of those places. Um, and research has shown that people are more likely to litter in areas outside of their own neighborhoods. Uh, number three is that it's an attitude people have that it's not my job to clean. So it's the job of the council, it's the job of the government. They should pick up the trash and we're not responsible for it. Um, so moving on to one of the anti-littering campaigns I'm going to share with you guys. Have any of you heard of this slogan before, don't mess with Texas? So this is um, one of the most popular slogans in the United States. In 2006, it was voted as the most popular slogan. Um, and this actually originates from an anti-littering campaign, which was started in 1985 by the Department of Transportation in Texas. So what they found was that on Texas highways, the amount of trash people were throwing out of cars was increasing rapidly. And the department was having to spend $20 million a year trying to pick up trash. The trash on highways was creating a lot of problems. For example, animals would come to scavenge for food uh, and they would get hit by cars. Um, people would have to swerve to avoid them. And also it was clogging the waterways next to the highways. And if people threw out flammable things like cigarettes, um, there was a risk of forest fires. So this campaign uh, started in Texas. They started with car bumper stickers, and then they moved to advertisements and songs and billboards. Uh, and they used a wide variety of mediums. And basically, they were targeting a very specific audience, um, which was young male pickup truck drivers. Um, and they found that by targeting this specific audience uh, and creating content which motivated them to stop littering, like this um, poster you can see below, they used the tagline, if your mother were Texas, would you still litter? So this was uh, one of the most effective campaigns. Um, and between 87 and 1990, there was a 72% decrease in littering on highways. Uh, later in the 1998 survey, they found that it was not just young males who were throwing litter, but it was 18 to 34 year old males and females. So when they found out that they slightly changed the um, symbolism used in the campaign. Um, and there were many other examples 
I found um, because this is a short presentation, I couldn't put more in here. Um, so I'm going to move directly to what makes an effective anti littering campaign. So number one is targeting the right audience. Number two is using the right media. Um, I've just spoken about these two. Number three is using uh, engaging multiple stakeholders. Uh, so this means uh, going to schools, going to universities, engaging people from the government, from the private sector, because this is a problem not restricted to any particular set of people. So it needs community action. Um, and number four, my point is building a community spirit. Um, this takes a long time because littering becomes a habit of people. And just like any bad habit, it's really difficult to break. So what you need is a campaign which is sustainable, which runs for a couple of years. Uh, the Don't Mess With Texas campaign, for example, has been running for, I think, more than 35 years. Um, and we don't have many campaigns in Pakistan which have run for that long. Um, so now, coming to Pakistan, we've got the Clean Green campaign, which was started recently by this government. And this campaign ticks a lot of the boxes. Um, for one thing, it's a five-year campaign, so it's much more likely to have a bigger impact. Uh, number two, they are engaging a lot of stakeholders. Uh, they're engaging schools, they're engaging uh, local communities. Um, and in my report, I have given some suggestions as to how uh, this campaign can be further improved. Uh, but generally, I think um, what Pakistan needs is a long-term campaign uh, which appeals to the youth, which uses social media, and it creates a message which can actually change the mindset of the young generation. And maybe in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, we'll be able to see the impact of that. Thank you. Just begin. I'll go really fast, so try to stay up to speed with me. So the topic of my discussion will be AI for renewable energy. And AI essentially means artificial intelligence. And when I say renewable energy, I'm specifically referring to uh, solar and wind energy. And so let's begin with it. Why would we want to move towards renewable energy? Uh, because we want no greenhouse emissions, no air pollutants, and a minimal depletion of Earth's natural reserves. And I'm talking this in comparison to, let's say, the fossil fuel industry. So, however, we, we face a very specific problem with renewable energy in that there is a very high cost of establishing and running power plants in that it takes 1 million US dollars per megawatt for solar and 2 to 3 million uh, US dollars per megawatt for wind, right? And these may not be that huge of amounts for a first world country like the United States, but for a country like uh, Pakistan, a third world country, the, the uh, establishing a solar power plant is a big decision. So the decision needs to be very carefully and smartly made, right? And we essentially need to optimize our decision in that we want to maximize uh, the energy that we harness from the solar or the wind power plant. And we want to minimize the cost that comes on on this power plant that we're placing, right? And uh, the problem is really complex in terms that we have to take care of a, a large amount of factors. These factors include from, if, if I talk about constructing a power plant, the factors range from where do we actually place the power plant? What, what are the wind dynamics in that area? What, how many clouds are there in that area typically? And uh, it's not as simple as that. We also have to take care of how far from the city are we going in order to establish the solar power plant? How much cost would it take to transport materials over there? And stuff like that. So you get the idea, it's really complex. And the first idea that comes to our mind is solving analytically. And that is by analytically, I mean, we, we bring in a bunch of experts that think about, all right, how to build this, how to, how to go about it, where to place it. But that, that, that is really difficult because the problem is extremely complex and there are tens of thousands of variables involved. And the patterns, as I mentioned earlier, are not, are not that simple and intuitive, right? So the proposed solution is the use of artificial intelligence for this purpose. And I'll quickly go over some of the definitions. So artificial intelligence and art, an artificially intelligent agent is basically a computer program that is able to make decisions without being explicitly programmed for them, right? And a, a very important branch of AI is machine learning where we actually learn patterns from data, not by knowledge, but by experience. What do I mean by that? Let's say if I wanna teach a machine learning uh, algorithm, 
to learn what what a cat is, right? I won't tell it that a cat has two eyes, two ears, and whiskers. I'll just simply show it hundreds of images of cats, and it will learn. All right, this is a cat. So, and, and moving forward to deep learning, deep learning is basically the branch of machine learning we, where we compress a single machine learning model or an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, into a single small neuron, right? And then we place hundreds of those neurons in a layer, and then hundreds of those layers we stack everything together just like the way they are stacked in our brain to form an intricate complex network that can make really complex decisions by understanding really, really complex, uh, complex patterns, right? So what is the goal over there? Why are we trying to use AI? Uh, what's the purpose? The goal is that if we, if we make a team of scientists sit down and try to try to suggest where, what should we do that team of scientists, let's say if, it, if the team studies one, one uh, power station from the world in one week, then it'll, it can merely learn 2,000 uh, 2, case studies within their lifetimes. On the other hand, if we take up a deep, deep neural network and train it overnight, it can learn millions of millions of case studies uh, within that night, right? And we've seen promising results from AI in the past. We've seen applications of AI from, uh, from stuff like, uh, basic stuff like image recognition and natural language processing, to complex tasks like optimizing the design in terms of the drag coefficient and the, uh, uh, and the air resistance of cars, right? There are companies like Aptera that are completely reliant on AI for designing their cars. And so how do we actually execute the process? We start by collecting data and we can find several data sets ranging from websites like Kaggle to data.wiz, where we can find real world data of solar power plants placed around the world and wind power plants placed around the world. And we that's all open source data, so we can download it, analyze it, and after some basic analysis, we can move towards more complex techniques like uniform manifold uh, dimensionality reduction and projection that we see over here. This is a technique from advanced general topology where we try to map complex data into some basic simple two or three dimensions so that we can cluster that data around, try to study data, backtrack it to where it actually came from and, and stuff like that. So then we can move towards the actual deep learning where we, over here we're using a technique called, uh, called generative adversarial networks. Or for the people who have an understanding of game theory, what we're actually doing is placing two deep neural networks. Then we're putting them in a competition in a minimax game, basically. So they're constantly improving each other in terms of generator is the network that tries to create a, a false or a fake data point. And the discriminator tries to tell whether this data point or let's say this data point within a solar power plant is real or fake. And slowly they become better and better from competition until until the generator is able to create data points that are so realistic that it's that they actually map the real world data. And now, so uh, if we had, let's say, uh, we had some amount of data, we can generate of organic data, we can now generate eight to 10 times more synthetic data and learn from it. And then we can use all of this data to, uh, to train a basic vanilla deep neural network. And we can move towards the next step, which is actually placing that model in a deep reinforcement learning environment. So by this, I mean that we, we take the deep neural network and we create a virtual environment and we place that deep neural network in that virtual environment with all the learning that it had from the organic and synthetic data. And now it tries to, tries to create a policy for placing the solar panels. Let's say it tries to place 10 solar panels and sees what happens from what it learned. Then it tries to experiment around in that virtual world. All right, what if I change these factors? What if I take that solar panel from a solar power plant from here to that area? What happens that it keeps experimenting, experimenting, and it keeps better and better at placing uh, power plants in that uh, in that virtual world until it comes with an optimal policy for placing and running solar and wind power plants. And then it moves. And then we can move forward. Once we have this this deep neural network, we can finally perform some evolution on the deep neural network via uh, techniques from genetic programming, where the where the algorithm actually evolves to form the final its final most optimized form. And when I said optimization, I'm not only uh, saying in terms of minimizing the cost and maximizing output. I'm also talking in terms of stuff like minimizing the lives taken. Let's say when we put a wind turbine out there and it, it kills birds when the birds come in the way of the wings, right? We want to reduce that to the minimum as well. And in the end, we have our end product is an AI-based optimization workflow that we can use to, to actually take suggestions for where should we place a uh, and how should we place a solar power plant and how should we run it? That's it. And that's the end. That's about it. Both Daniel and Ali, uh, because the thing that they have described is going to complement my project, the, the presentation that I'm going to give. Let me share the screen.
So basically what I'm going to present is present something very similar to what Ali read, but in very simple terms so that you can understand it. My final project uh, for uh, this course was was on base management using uh, data science. Why waste management is important? Uh, well, it's not that there is, isn't any waste management happening. It's, it's just that the waste produced in the modern era is uh, very complex. It's non-biodegradable and dangerously uh, in high volume, uh, which leads to misleading of uh, waste. And that causes the formation of illegal dump sign and also the loss of recycle recycled items. How that happens? Uh, recycled items uh, gets contaminated, and they lose their recyclability, and hence they gets dumped into uh, the land side. The project that I'm going to explain to you was undertaken in Europe, and it uses data science to uh, uh, to come up with more efficient and smart uh, waste management uh, techniques. What is data science? Data science just is, is just uses mathematics and machine learning techniques uh, to process to process data and to come up with results, which can then be visualized to come uh, to help in decision making. The project that I'm going to explain to you, the goal of this project was to predict the formation of illegal dump site. This was done to three subtasks. First was to create a data set, which was fed into a system. Uh, for training, and then the system was able to predict whether an empty piece of land would become uh, uh, an illegal dump site in the future or not. And then those observations can be used by relevant environment protection agencies to intervene and stop it. Now I'm going to explain to you how all of this uh, happens. First, uh, the data was collected using an app called Trash Out, and it allowed citizens themselves to report the location of a of an illegal dump site and other relevant information. Then all this relevant information was integrated onto a, a map uh, like this. And using various G GPS techniques, uh, we can estimate the values of these five features regarding a dump site, and which can which will then be fed into a, a system for training. What is a feature? Feature is an attribute that describes an object. The object in this project, in our, in my case, is the dump is a dump site. So a dump site is described by these uh, five features on the screen. Uh, so basically, what happens is okay, okay, we will input around like a uh, thousand or hundred thousand uh, dump sites, and each dump site will be described by these five features, and all of that will be will be fed into a system for training and how the system gets trains and then is able to predict that happens through a machine learning technique called uh, classification and now i'm going to explain now i'm going to give you a very baseline uh, definition of classification obviously the classification is actually very complex in this but uh, for for my non science peers i'm going to explain it to you in a very a simple and uh, simple words and using a very simple example. For example, we will input uh, into our system 10 sites. Five of them are going to be dump sites and five of them are going to be non-dump sites. Why we will input uh, uh, five non-dump sites into a system? Uh, as uh, like Ali mentioned in his presentation, uh, because we want our system to know what is a dump site at the same time, we want our system to also know what is a non-dump site. Let me give you an example. If if we show like hundred pictures of cats, of of cats of different cats to a baby, it will know what is a, what it is a cat. But if we show it a picture of a dog, it will not know what that it is a dog or it it's not a cat. It might end up saying that it's still a cat because it has never seen a picture of a dog. So we will uh, input both these uh, five dump sites and five non five non dump sites into the system with just two features in the project that i was uh, that i uh, with, with just two features okay one feature is on the x-axis and the other feature is on the y-axis so this what how the system trains trains the system trains uh, by plotting uh, 
uh, the, these dump sites onto onto a graph and like these uh, orange circles represents five dump sites at the same time it will also plot the non dump sites and then it will it will like find it will fit a line like uh, it will fit a line to separate these two different uh, classes so that it knows okay, on its left hand side is the dump site and its right hand side is a non dump site so like now our system is trained so if we input an empty piece of land and uh, its two features that describe that piece of land into the system okay now the system knows okay, uh, this uh, dump site, this piece of land is on its left hand side. So it's so so it knows that it is a dump site. It will label it as a dump site and output that. If, for example, we input another piece of land, another so 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 it knows that it is on its right hand side. To it, so so it it knows that it is a uh, non dump site. And that that is the, like the basic definition of a, a classification. That's how a system. Uh, is able to predict whether an empty piece of land is a dump site or a non dump site using these observations these uh, results can then be uh, used uh, like can be used by relevant environment uh, agencies and they can team up with both citizen and the government to come up with intervention strategies and like uh, plan cleanup events and make people aware and stop the formation of illegal dump sites uh, thank you uh, hello everyone. So I'll be presenting about uh, the agent-based modeling of forward osmosis and membrane distillation. So this was actually uh, Ma'am's pre previous uh, PhD thesis, and I promise I wasn't really buttering her up. That's not why I kept this model. It was actually a very interesting idea because it has implications such as actually solving uh, the war crisis that we face today with areas such as desalination. And so I actually saw this as a really uh, potential heavy topic. So firstly, I want to talk about exactly what agent-based modeling is. Um, and a precursor that, as I am one of those non-science peers that Hamza talked about, I'll try to keep this as, non, uh, as intuitive as possible because I totally get that a lot of these ideas are very complicated. So agent-based modeling, it's simply a coding software where agents are able to interact with their set environments. So those agents could be anything that have properties and are able to have interactions with other um, uh, with other uh, with other agents around them so in this case we had water uh, solvents and solutes and the membrane acting as an agent whereas uh, um, um, and so we create an environment around them so to look at it the the ui is added because it looks a little bit like this so not the best looking software, but it's actually quite powerful. Anyways, um, moving on to uh, the forward osmosis, you have to understand what it exactly is. Now on this, it's important to understand that we, uh, there are two types of cells within the uh, overarching uh, process. So the feed solution and the draw solution, and there's membrane cell in between. So we, uh, so the feed is as uh, using MAPS example, where we have the wastewater that, uh, that is uh, that is used as the feed. Take, uh, it's pumped into and using the fl uh, the flow meter, it just regulates the flow of the water, which can also be known as the flux, drawn uh, inside. And then uh, the draw solution is where the extracted water is. It's, it has a few solutes as well to better regulate flux along with other variables. And so the membrane helps with the filtration. So now when we focus it further into this cell, we go over here now. Sorry. So the feed side itself, it just has a lower osmotic pressure compared to the draw side. To understand what osmotic pressure is, in a very, very simple term, we can just see that higher osmotic pressure would mean that the membrane would, uh, uh, it would be harder for the water to pass through the membrane than at a lower osmotic pressure. So for the feed side, we just have uh, it losing water uh, towards the draw side. And so the, the sludge that is left behind gets more and more concentrated and that can be drawn out. This is, a, uh, this is the general uh, format of this process on how uh, water will be drawn into the draw solution where it can, uh, where you, considering that uh, as, as you can see in the previous photo, it is also being pumped back uh, 
through the draw tank. And so it has uh, something like fertilizer, which has solutes. Um, you can consider solute as sodium chloride, which I'll show you in my own model. So it also uh, regulates the flux further, which can draw water towards, uh, towards the draw side. And so looking a little bit even further, we can just see that quickly what the membrane is like. So there are two parts to this, the active layer and the porous support, which is the dilutive uh, layer. So the active layer, as, it's, uh, as the name suggests, it's just more concentrated. So it actually stops the solutes from actually uh, penetrating the membrane towards the draw side. This allows for better filtration through it. So uh, before actually moving on to the model itself, we just look at what the objective for my report was because, um, well, I just explained the osmosis pro uh, process. Now, uh, what was, was I aiming to get from it? So firstly, I want to examine the feasibility of these agent-based models as substitutes for real-world experimentation, which are applicable specifically in times like right now, so where you don't really have as much lab access. So how viable are they? Which moves on to the second point about validity, that I compared these lab-tested uh, data with better complex ABMs than the one I created because that was more of a visual representation uh, the, and the data that was derived through it. So the, so the model I used in my report was by Therain and Musabi who created actually through using NetLogo a much, much more complex and uh, practical um, ABM and their data, well, it was concluded that it was actually quite substantial. And lastly, just determine scenarios where these comparable simulator models can be applied for everyone's benefit. So one example of this is specifically for learning processes. So how students would have a much more hands-on experience once they uh, are able to see these processes work in simulated models where they are able to control the variables better as well. So moving on to the actual uh, model, this is what I've created. So you just, uh, I've added very few stuff compared to a much more complex model, but basically over here, you can choose the different solute types you want in your draw tank. The darker circles definitely represent uh, water, uh, wastewater. This one is that. So, so a lot of the code was based on just uh, a lot of uh, how those molecules, what the physics is behind it. So there are certain sliders representing the temperature that can affect the model. In this case, higher temperature can just lead to a higher velocity of molecules, but you can make that further using the overall code setting here and Furthermore, so once we just set it up and press go, we can see how uh, the solutes and uh, most of the water molecules from the uh, draw tank are being repelled, whereas the wastewater is actually able to penetrate through the membrane. Now, I realize that this is not as complex as the actual model, of course, but uh, the whole point is that once we add more and more uh, variables onto it, such as, well, water replacement here, you add flux, you add temperature uh, along with many others, uh, you actually are able to get uh, a much uh, better understanding uh, overall simulation model. And so this whole software actually just allows you to provide uh, better data. So over here is one, uh, like a few representations of it. The water graph just shows that how much due to the uh, solutes extracting water further and further, you're able to have a lesser feed and much more uh, concentration of uh, water molecules in the draw uh, solution. So for, uh, so you can have that going further and further uh, with many, many other variables. And so overall leading to a complex model. And so this was basically just testing the validity of the model. Yeah, that was it, I think. If you have any questions, I hope we can answer later on during the Q&A session. Yeah, late material. Uh, Ma'am, am I audible and my screen is visible? Your screen is becoming visible and you're audible, yes. Okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, I am Ikra and the topic that I chose for my uh, policy brief uh, is, the, is to study the effects of climate change on agriculture and the food, in, uh, food security, uh, basically for the rulers. And... Um, the low income peoples. So the structure for the uh, presentation that I uh, go along with is this. 
uh first of all uh, the agriculture pakistan is being an agriculture country is be, is heavily depend on agriculture sector is gdp and the labor force and also pakistan uh, food production is totally based on this agriculture sector but still pakistan faces a, a significant food insecurity and more than 60% of the population are food insecure and consume uh, less than the food required uh, requirement so why what is the reason of the food inaccessibility and the accessibility and availability of the food and one is the uh, one of the reasons is the climate change pakistan is the uh, is among the more vulnerable country of the climate change and the more vulnerable sector is the uh, agriculture sector so these are the parameters which uh, i also uh, focused in my report temperature and the rainfall pattern but if we look uh, uh, like statistically uh, we can uh, predict that wheat wheat production decreased by 6 to 9% uh, which is significant by every 1 degree centigrade increase in temperature that is a lot and it uh, uh, it reduce uh, it in increase the insecurity of the food uh, the rainfall patterns is also um, also affects uh, the food productive uh, productivity and cause the floods and the droughts in the uh, land so what are the uh, uh, what are the solutions and the strategies so as we have uh, studied in our course as well that the climate smart agriculture is the one of uh, the solution strategies and these are the practices that we have studied in our course uh, so the main focus is farmers uh, in pakistan uh, uh, like policies are formulated but the implementation is not strong and for these policies and the farmers are unaware of the um, unaware of 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 these uh, practices and the climate smart agriculture and and the cropping pattern according to the climate change so the first thing first is the before the formation of the policy and after the formation of the policy farmers perspective really matters because if farmers are not satisfied they will not adopt the policy so farmers uh, farmers pre uh, uh, preference and the perspective is the number one then the community based farming is the second factor because in uh, agriculture sector uh, the small farmer follow the pattern of the larger farmer or the bigger farmer who owns the bigger land so farm and training providing the training and the sessions to the bigger farmer contributes to co contributes the adoption in the lower in the like the smaller farmers or the who own small lands um the trainings in the government schools will allow the future farmers to con to become a progressive farmer and also contributes towards the current production and current uh, food accessibility uh agriculture based competition the first question came into my mind is pakistan invest in the uh, tech based uh, competitions but not uh, largely on the agriculture based competitions uh if we provide them the small like the uh, to provide them a small acre land to the fresh graduate uh, which uh, which are graduate from the agriculture universities will allow them to produce much bigger like much bigger scale and also to adopt these practices with a bigger scale and um and also the social media campaigns which also an other factor because uh, if if not the small farmers but bigger farmers or the uh, farmers which are uh, uh, like in the head of the community owns a mobile and all the social media so by uh, by providing them the awareness campaigns and by providing them the printed or the social media campaigns will uh, help a lot to spread the word and and not only these but also providing them the data of the previous uh, previous um, uh, productions using the uh, smart uh, smart uh, agriculture i also mentioned my, in my report ki how uh, smart agriculture adopting only one or two strategies um, affecting the food uh, food uh, security by 9% and reducing the poverty by 12% which is a lot and it have the food insecurity reducing the food insecurity and climate risk a lot uh, i um, to get a deep inside uh, of the like of of the policy and also the affect real impact on the climate uh, 
uh, change uh, to the farmers and also the productivity and how they um, pursue it. Uh, I took an interview with uh, the farmer who is located in Karachi, uh, whose name is Hamza, uh, Muhammad Hamza. But um, this interview is, uh, is like uh, 30 minutes long, so I will not play. But I will happy to play like the short summary, which uh, I edited. So I think this is not allowing me to, but I can. Um, view here. Sorry, my uh, internet is acting up, so like that's why it's taking a huge like time to. Okay. Um. Uh, is the voice is audible? Hello? No, it's not, Nikra. It's not? Okay, wait. Um, really it's sorry. Audible. Is it? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, then play it again, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. not audible. Okay. <laughs> Ikra, why did you um, send it? I think, I think Ikra, you should, you should have to re uh, share your skin with audio. I uh, okay. Ikra, you why did you send it? Yeah. Uh, why did you send it as an attach attachment to the class? And then they, they can. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. And then, of course, I, I'll, I've looked at your report in detail. So it's, it's all right. I think we should just go on to Droshan. That's okay. Uh -huh. okay stop. Thank you with other organisms that we can use to biodegrade the heavy metals. And also, uh, moreover, these bioremediation, this process is not very economic friendly for uh, developing countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. And sometimes the products of bioremediation are even more toxic than the heavy metal itself, because in some processes we are getting carbon dioxide and methane gases, which are uh, the greenhouse gases. Now, um, we are going to look into detail as to how bacteria are used to uh, basically accumulate metal and counteract its toxicity. So what happens is that we have got metal binding proteins on the cell walls of bacteria on which these metal ions are forced to bound to. And so this rate of accumulation basically depends on external uh, environmental factors like pH, temperature, and different microorganisms and the bacteria concentration. The advantage of this technique is that it can be used on a larger scale, uh, such as purifying water in drainage pipes or sewage systems. Um, now, at this point, all of you might be wondering that how come that uh, the toxicity of the metal is not going affecting the bacteria because we are using bacteria to basically degrade the metal. So what happens is that throughout these um, years, bacteria has developed resistance. They have evolved and developed resistance to the toxicity of heavy metals. And so they're able to basically um, degrade the metals. And also uh, they degrade the metals through different processes. One, that the bacteria has a protective layer, protein layer on itself, which uh, basically makes it resistant to the heavy metal. Secondly, there are different processes that bacteria uh, undergoes when it's uh, degrading heavy metals. For example, active transport, extracellular uh, sequestration, and also in recent years, biologists, what they're doing is that they're trying to transfer this resistivity gene from bacteria to other microorganisms so that we can get a range full of other variety of microorganisms that we can use to counteract our heavy metal problems. I try to make my slides simple because like I try to not to add so many biological definitions. So I hope I'm clear enough till now. And yeah, so and if there are like any questions, you can ask me in Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm a, I'm a audible. Yes. Hello. Okay, so Assalamu alaikum everyone. So the topic that I decided to do my final project uh, focuses on environmental sociology and the role of capitalism in the environment. Uh, I have chosen this topic because I'm a sociology major and I tend to look at everything from a sociological perspective. So first talking about the field of environmental sociology. Um, 
it uh, it basically means to apply sociological theories to create a link between humans technology institutions and the environment that forms the foundation of any society humans survive depending on the biophysical environment uh, environmental sci- environmental scientists often think that the factors such as uh, overpopulation global warming air and water pollution are the main culprits of the ecological crisis however they often refuse to look beyond the picture and focus on the root cause that is causing these problems so capitalism as most of you know is a theory by karl marx uh, capitalism basically paves the way for industrial and technological development the profit maximization motif allows entrepreneurs and economic agents to increase productivity mainly by enabling them to allocate to allocate resources that result in more profit leading to growth and dynamism while such strategies are leading to the development of the global world it is also giving rise to more competition in the market these entrepreneurs and economic agents have to develop alternate and unique ways to to sustain themselves in the saturated market it often needs them to invest in cost cutting technologies that provide promise and increase in productivity and efficiency however they lead to further rise in profits so the question arises that how is capitalism affecting the environment and what role does it play so basically the massive industrial production economic growth and living and the rising living standards of people lead to the depletion of natural resources our planet is already composed of some limited amount of amounts of natural resources which are being utilized rapidly for the sustainability of this capitalist system this is affecting us in the long run because if natural resources are being consumed at a rapid rate we might entirely run out of them in the near future not only that this capitalist economic system has given birth to, to environmental hazards like air water and soil pollution it also affects the everyday lives of people these environmental hazards affect the bio biogeochemical bio- cycles thus disrupting all the human life on earth according to reports in the mid 1990s the rate of greenhouse emissions into the atmosphere has increased rapidly Mainly due, to, mainly due to the strong economic growth in minerals it proves that there is a direct relationship between environmental hazard and an and an increase in economic growth when coming to deforestation the answer is simple human activities that are carried out under the influence of capitalism that is the globalization globalization and, and industrialization for economic growth leads to exploitation of the natural environment by the cutting down trees for creating for creating wood and furniture or agriculture practices with without thinking about nature's consequences so i have already talked talked about this uh, when so now we come to eco marxism eco marxism uh, is another theory which is not directly described by Mar- karl marx but it is uh, like uh, described by other Uh, philosophers who have combined the ecological perspective with the marxist theory so from the eco marxist point of view capitalism is the root cause of environmental problems because the sole sole reason for capitalism is the maximization of profits by all means possible uh, in the words of Paul, karl marx who is a philosopher behind the capitalism theory uh, labor is the father of material wealth the other is the, the other the earth is its mother uh eco marxism basically believes that earth is being exploited and that the influence of capitalism uh, two main agents contribute to the creation of wealth humans and nature to sustain life and development both of them must be in control so what is the solution to this uh capitalism is a system which can acc- accumulate gains wherever possible to s- to sustain itself uh it is not easy to escape capitalism in the 21st century where everything around us is happening under this system however there is one possible solution and that is the implementation of non market in interve- interventions the state should execute no non market interventions by imposing heavy ta- heavy tax on firms which cause uh, any damage to the environmental to to environment but there is one limitation to it in democratic and non democratic countries influential business groups do not do not let this happen because it intervenes in the in the way of success and makes enormous profits it can also lead to lower employment 
opportunities. This is why countries like China and, and India are oblivious of the disadvantages of industrialization, industrialization for the environment. Another option uh, can be to implement uh, of the, of the non-market intervention through social forces uh, in democratic states, environmental activities can create awareness campaigns and movements for the formulation of strict laws for environmental preservation. There's another solution, but it's, it is not very feasible, and that is raising voice through international cooperation. Uh, in conclusion, non-market entities are the only way in which we might be able to protect and preserve our land, as capitalism has taken over our activities so much that it is almost impossible to come out of, out of this system in this 21st century, as it has been embedded with us since the beginning. Thank you. So if you have any questions, you can ask in the Yes. OK. So um, this presentation, it's going to be slightly weirder <laughs> than all the other presentations. Um, I'll be employing a literary eco-critical lens to explore the representation of environment and agriculture in Thomas Hardy's works, um, Tess of the Durbervilles and The Mayor of Castorvich. OK. Um, so who was Hardy? Um, Hardy was a renowned British novelist whose work is laden with environmentalism and an active awareness about how the advent of industrial revolution in Europe meant the transition from ruralism to mechanization. So he himself was discomforted by how the ruthless forces of capitalism and industrialization that were rendering the rural workers obsolete and displacing them as their traditional roots were being you know, taken away from them. So this greatly bothered Hardy, and he laid emphasis on how the individual and the environment are not two discordant or disparate concepts. They're not two separate forces, but they should instead be viewed as a harmonized, cohesive whole. OK. Um, well, so now you must be wondering, what difference can literature possibly make in a global environmental crisis? Um, so well, you know, the answer is simple. The answer is ecofiction. So what exactly is ecofiction? Ecofiction is basically a branch of literature that encapsulates nature-oriented or environment-oriented works of fiction. So what it does is it inculcates a literary consciousness within individuals by pressing them to be more careful about the ways in which they interact with the environment. So the correlation is simple. The higher the literary, liter literacy rates of a society, the more acquainted the individuals will be of the environmental crisis surrounding them. Ecofiction establishes how man persecutes and overpowers nature, whereas ecofeminism, which is another literary term, it proposes that environment and women are both treated as subaltern groups by men who exploit their unadulterated beauty and beneficence. So if I were to ex extract an example from Hardy's Tess of the Turbervilles, um, it is when, you know, the wild hunters in the book um, who are emblematic of, you know, forces of patriarchy, they sort of apathetically butcher the pheasants, the birds in the novel. And <clears throat> this reminds Tess, who is um, Hardy's tragic heroine, about the way her vulnerability was expo exploited and she was raped. So patriarchy is thus antagonized as the primitive rural woman seeks solace in the bounty of nature. Okay. So another sub genre of literature is pastoral literature, which is um, basically about the idyllic and fictionalized representation of rural life, which is far remo removed from the banal realities of urban spaces. So most of Hardy's spatial and geographical settings are situated in his beloved home country of Wessex, which was the hub of traditional rural life. He observed the losses and gains of economic and social changes and denounced the way rural workers were all stereotypically represented as hodges um, by the community. <clears throat> he claimed that they were enjoying the privileges of the highest kind of pastoral lifestyle. So this, this is very re relevant if I were to apply this to our Pakistani context as well, because if you Pakistan, you realize that oh, this is a You know, like you just bring down an individual's entire identity to this one statement. So this, is, this was something that Hardy was against, right? So according to Hardy, the transition from harmony of rural life 
drive to its ultimate disintegration as forces of industrialization dominated it uh, is a great modern tragedy. Uh, uh, in Tess of the Durbervilles, he also depicts how the modern man is sickening away from nature. Um, this is a really interesting quote by Hardy. An object or mark raised or made by man on a scene is worth 10 times any such formed by unconscious nature. <clears throat> so, um, Hardy's eco-fiction work can also be linked to the uh, theory of tragedy of commons that we studied in our classes as well, uh, if you might remember from you know, our earlier classes. Human apathy can be connected with how the individual self-interest is prioritized over communal benefit. Uh, an example of this from the text is when Farfrey, the modern technician of a, ta uh, uh, of a town mayor, introduces new scientific farming and sewing techniques without paying heed to the fact that the labor class would have to face unemployment because their work would be taken away from them if machinery replaces them, right? So um, it's also really uh, wistful because one rural lady even observes in, in the text that the romance of the sore is gone, highlighting how the advent of clean revolution in Europe meant that an entire lifestyle was, you know, debunked, which can also be seen in Pakistan as well, because just as we are having all these modern, uh, you know, technological uh, machinery, the, the farmer we had the other day, he also elaborated upon this. So the work of the farmer is being taken away from him. So now, um, lastly, I'll be commenting on how Hardy's work uh, was heavily influenced by Darwinism. And those of who you are um, from the science wala field would know about um, Darwinism. So um, Darwinism's uh, survival of the fittest psyche, you know, it claimed that selection arose from radiation in individual members of the species. And um, it was sustained by uh, the surrounding environment, which favors certain characteristics. So he emphasized on the power of circumstances and externalities to alter the outcome of natural selection. So this can also be linked to the idea of an of adaption in organisms that we studied uh, when we were looking at the biosphere, right? So certain organisms assume specific behavior and physical characteristics in order to survive in specific environments. For example, animals, uh, you know, they develop body fair and fat to uh, um, survive in cold regions. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Um, the topic of my presentation is dairy industry wastewater management. Namra, <clears throat> your screen is not visible. I can see it. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Mm, among all the industries, among all industries, dairy industry is considered to be the major source of wastewater because it produces large amount of wastewater. To promote, uh, we should make people aware of various procedures to pro uh, for treating dairy industry wastewater to protect our environment from pollutants and to provide future generations a pollution-free environment. There are, are over six million consumers of dairy products because dairy industry does not have single production like it includes the production of milk cheese butter skim milk and many other products and dairy industry meet our food and economic need because dairy industry not only uh, serve industry worker industrial worker but also serve people who are taking care of their animals and people from rural areas pakistan dairy industry the fifth largest dairy industry because milk is our uh, basic food need and it contains nutrients and antibodies which protect our body from various infections and diseases. Therefore, it is our top priority to provide people with, uh, with high quality and pure milk. 
dairy industry functioning. Uh, milk treatment is the first pro uh, step for processing raw milk. Milk treatment, it is done in preparation room. Dairy industry is dairy industry is production oriented based on how many product it produces. As I mentioned above, it can uh, it produces various in, uh, dairy products. So based on how many product it produces, production of these products depends on milk supply. Milk treatment processes uh, involve clarification, separation, formation of butter, buttermilk, and skim milk. Clarification and separation include separation of suspended particles. During pasteurization, milk is heated at 62 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes, and it is followed by, uh, by cooling at 4 degrees centigrade. After pasteurization, first milk is passed through a centrifugal machine to separate cream and skim milk. Cream obtained is turned to get butter, and ghee is then obtained from butter. In milk storage process, milk is kept between reception and processing, and these are uh, mostly stored in stainless steel vessels. Dairy industry based water generation. All the dairy industry does not use like hazardous chemical, but it's still harmful to our environment. The question is how it is harmful. So dairy industry contain organic and inorganic component. Organic components are basically, basically like carbohydrate, protein, lactose, lipids, and inorganic components like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So there are categories of water in dairy industries, such as cooling water, which is produced in special coolers, condensers, uh, uh, cooler condensers, industrial, way, uh, industrial water, is water which is used for cooling industrial equipment. Sanitary water, it comes from lavatories and shower rooms. So therefore, it can be directed into sea waste treatment plants. Uh, dairy industry uh, uh, waste water is basically alkaline in nature and become acidic due to fermentation of milk into lactic acid, which is uh, also contain degradable carbohydrate and lactose. And uh, whey cheese can be used for making whey drinks, baker's yeast, and anti uh, antibiotics, lactic acid, and vitamins. Effects of dairy uh, industrial effluents on our environment. Let's talk about impacts on water. Dairy, uh, dairy industry based water deplete oxygen level in water bodies and or in an aerobic condition results in decay of microorganisms and in even fishes. Dairy industry are also toxic for fishes. So it become a receiving place for mosquitoes that cause malaria, dengue fever, and yellow fever, and etc. In COD, so uh, in COD, oxygen is used to oxidize organic component into CO2 and water, whereas MOD organic matter is converted in, into some bacterial cell. Similarly, lactose present in dairy industry waste can uh, cause the growth of sewage fungus. And uh, here is the lactose concentration can be related to sewage fungus by given equation, which is mentioned here. Similarly, suspended particle in dairy industry waste can uh, cause turbidity. Effects on land. Dairy industry dumped uh, into land can be taken up by plants. And if uh, nitrates enter in our food and become part of our body, it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin and ultimately cause death. So dairy industry uh, or dairy industry based water can also enter the atmosphere by volatilization of ammonia and denitrification in which nitrogen is, uh, in which microorganisms reduce nitrogen into nit uh, nitrous oxide and dinitrogen gases. Similarly, dairy industry results in emission of CO2, methane, and nitrogen oxide and phosphorus. These gases are greenhouse gases and can cause global warming. So here are <clears throat> some wastewater treatments available. In the uh, wetland is a natural way to treat uh, dairy wastewater treatments. So, but wetland require large surface area cause pollutions, and at a, as I talked earlier, it can be, become receiving place for mosquitoes and can cause diseases. And similarly, it can also impact the groundwater pathways and cause diseases such as malaria and typhoid. The other uh, infected treatments include mechanical procedure, which removes suspended particles from wastewater. In, it includes chambers, skimming tank, and classifier. Chamber removes suspended particles, Suspe uh, skimming tank remove oil and grease, and clarifier allow matter to be settled down. This settled down material is uh, sludge, which is uh, sent for treatment to make it harmless. In chemical treatment, flocculants are added to precipitate out phosphate, which is an inorganic component, which is also harmful for our environment. In the last, there is biological treatment. 
and it is the only processing method for removal of organic matter and it includes two procedures uh, aerobic and uh, and anaerobic aerobic in aerobic treatment microorganisms are grown to convert matter uh, organic matter into co2 and water whereas in anaerobic organic matter is stabilized by converting it into biomass similarly in sludge treatment uh, similarly in sludge treatment sludge uh, collected by above process is broken down into methane co2 and hydrogen gas uh, and these gases are then used to uh, remove uh, to remove water from sludge and this dewatered sludge is used as fertilizer and may be disposed of these uh, treatments can uh, be suggested to any industrial owner and they can and they can easily apply it and we can protect our environment from dairy industry waste water thank you I wanted my presentation to be short and simple and um, but it's too short and too simple okay so at this point uh, we all know what climate change is so we'll be talking about the reasons for this climate change i'm um, not reasons actually just one um, that is climate inaction the word inaction here refers to the lack of translation of knowledge that people have about climate change into their actions also um reasons for climate change can be both natural and anthropogenic that is human based um initially i had planned to do a literature review on the topic but while doing so i found out that the anthropogenic reasons account more for climate change than the natural ones so um, i got this weird urge to explore the anthropogenic reasons so i created a questionnaire and conducted a survey then analyzed my research findings based on the knowledge that i had obtained through that um initial literature review okay so i'm moving on the anthropological reasons for climate change or the drivers for inaction include both um, psychological and physiological factors the physiological factors refer to the physical ability and availability of people while the psychological factors account for the reasons behind this physiological inactiveness um so the target audience for my questionnaire were people who were aware of the climate change that is university going people or people who have moved on to their professional lives when i analyzed the results of my questionnaire i found two kinds of people those who were aware of the issue at hand but they were subconsciously they chose um, not to work for its improvement and then those who tried to initiate the process but then after a while retreated back to their old ways then i found two factors that could potentially explain such a behavior i've listed them here so environmental numbness here refers to the state of being unmindful of one's physical surroundings due to the absence of any instantaneous difficulty what people don't see um their mind does not believe another explanation of environmental numbness is the lack of consideration for the issue due to excessive exposure to information about it yeah this happens it's like when you see an ad several times um you start ignoring the details after a while that's the same thing okay so the second factor here is judgment discounting it refers to people discounting their own problems in their minds when they see other people having it worse this is the reason that even if some people start a course of action they revert it back their mind is convinced that um that their problem is not bad enough when it sees other people or other areas uh, with a problem worse than their own that is the concept of relativity so that will be it um uh, am i audible yes okay so uh, our topic is the impact of overpopulation on environment in urban cities of pakistan and my group members are iman ali malik anam ayman farooq and i am anam shafqat um so overpopulation is known as uh, also known as overabundance is the state in which the number of members in a particular species exists exceeds the sustainable size within a certain environment or habitat uh, the excessive population can lead to environmental damage and deteriorating living standards therefore should be controlled um the current birth rate of for pakistan in 2020 is 27.530 births per 1000 people 
in 1970 the urban population of pakistan was 24.8 person until 2019 it had increased to 36 36.9 percent at an uh, average rate of uh, growing at an average rate of 0.81 person annually um now over to amin uh, right so the environmental impact of overpopulation along with other anthropogenic variables can be best demonstrated by the ipat model um this equation measures the human impact on the environment where i stands for the human impact p stands for population a stands for affluence or consumption per person and t stands for technology as you can see population is one of the variables here but we argue that population is one of the most important variables especially when this equation is applied to urban cities in pakistan um in urban cities in pakistan um these cities are majorly home to the affluent upper middle class and upper class people uh, and it is these people that use the greatest amounts of technology thus a population increase in these communities will include an increase in the other two variables also and thus puts a greater pressure on pakistan's natural capital than pakistan can sustain thus the problem of overpopulation is of serious concern right now um in pakistan a country that is the sixth most populous country of the world over to iman now okay so i'll be talking about the uh, relationship between the lithosphere and local population the lithosphere is the rocky layer of the earth where humans animals and plants live on it consists of rock soil minerals and landforms such as mountains valleys etc overpopulation greatly impacts the lithosphere and this can be seen from various reasons firstly in order to cater to the growing population trees are cut in order to make housing societies an example of such a housing society is model town in lahore likewise islamabad was also initially a forest however trees were cut in order to house the country's officials according to dawn news the area of forest has reduced from 3.59 million hectares to 3.32 million hectares at an average rate of 27000 hectares annually in pakistan so we can say that these alarming rates have a disastrous effect on the environment they will reduce the amount of oxygen which will be explained later and they also contribute to soil erosion tree roots anchor onto the soil however deforestation causes the soil to be in direct contact with the water and the air this causes the erosion of the topmost fertile layer of the soil making the land unsuitable for farming in addition to that in order to cater to the growing population more food is also needed thus farmers are forced to resort to unsustainable practices such as monocropping and using genetically modified crops which in turn need more chemical fertilizers pesticides thus reducing the amount of nutrients in the soil and exhausting the soil moreover and more livestock such as cows and goats are also kept which overgraze causing a harm to the soil all of this can eventually lead to desertification and this is a big problem especially in arid and dry areas such as thar and balochistan similarly the increase in population also means an increase in fossil fuels for electricity to heat homes and to power vehicles since fossil fuels take millions of years to form they are unrenewable and finite meaning they are limited in number pakistan although has high amounts of coal especially in the thar coal field areas in sin the coal is of bad quality it has low carbon content and has high sulfur content Pakistan and according to, in, uh, in addition to that Pakistan has less amounts of oil and gas due to the growing population there is a constant need for mining for more fossil fuels trees are cut again to uh, carry out mining mining also causes the release of harmful gases like sulfur dioxide which will be explained later furthermore mining processes such as drilling excavating blasting and crushing can also cause so sound pollution sound pollution can be defined as unnecessary noise that affects humans and animals adversely this can cause an increase in the stress levels can and can also disrupt the wildlife now on to anam um so um atmosphere is the layers or blanket of gases that surround the earth uh, it contains the air we breathe and protects the earth from harmful uv radiation and prevents the heat on earth from escaping into the space and also controls the climate of the earth uh atmosphere consists of uh, four layers troposphere stratosphere mesosphere and thermosphere Um, a study was conducted in 2009 by Paul A. A. Murta and uh, Michael G. Schlax, in which they studied the relationship between population go uh, growth and global warming. According to the study, the carbon legacy of one child would produce 20 times more greenhouse gas than a person can save by recycling, um, using energy-efficient machinery and light bulbs, and driving energy-saving cars, etc. 
gases like carbon dioxide nitrous oxide sulfur dioxide and excess are extremely dangerous uh, the sectors that are main contributors of these gases in pakistan are the energy transport se uh, transportation sector which contributes 46% followed by agricultural se sector uh, which contributes 41% other than other than that forestry sector 6% Uh, industrial processes 5% in residential and commercial use 2% effects of these gases in access include heat trapping climb uh, which leads to climate change uh, smog which is a mixture of smog smoke and fog and these gases rise up where they mix and react with um, water and oxygen uh, to create pollutants that uh, cause acid rain and some of these uh, some of the dust uh, particles of dust can turn acidic and are deposited on buildings and statues and can damage them now over to imen again all uh, right so um, the growth in population of the country has resulted in disastrous impacts on um, the hydrosphere and the water supplies the only valuable resource that comes free with an infinite supply um the most important impact is perhaps the disruption of the hydrological cycle in the country human activities like with the building of infrastructure um and roads have removed the vegetation from the surfaces and the vegetation has been replaced by an impervious layer of cement and of concrete on surfaces um this layer has produced infiltration uh, and absorption into the ground of the water and the groundwater and aquifer supplies have diminished and the water table has dropped low for urban cities um and an additional consequence of this human change is an increase in the surface runoff and water discharge as there is no natural ground cover to intercept rainfall um or hold back the surface runoff this further also causes sedimentation and flooding again um, leading to uh, loss of habitats and also loss of lives uh, less tree cover in urban cities has also led to lesser amounts of vapor transpiration which uh, technically means that there is uh, less rainfall um in in the more drier cities of pakistan Uh, another problem that comes with overpopulation in the country is a shortage of water supplies which in turn can affect the environment as well due to an increasing number of people the number the need for water for irrigation to grow crops for the growing population has also increased tremendously in pakistan the irrigation water is not um, regulated sometimes causing an increased amount of water to flood the fields this in turn causes them to become waterlogged and later salinized salinized this is a phenomenon most common in the indus basin where approximately 30 to 40% of the uh, irrigated land has become salinized due to this uh, due to over abundance of water for irrigation at the same time with the hydrological cycle being disrupted uh, and the water for consumption being uh, at alarming rates the ground water supplies are being compromised without being replenished at the same rate this water scarcity means that um, humans are extracting water from ground water uh, to fulfill their non consumption needs also in addition to this water pollution is a problem pakistan is well versed with uh, increased human waste and sewage discharge can um, cause um, high bod levels which is biological oxygen demand and low do levels um this has ultimately uh, resulted in tarnished oxygen supplies for marine animals ultimately leading to fish and other marine animals dying an example of this phenomena is the trout fish in the kahan valley numbers of trout fish have seen sharp declines after an increase in freshwater pollution in the kunhar river a great proportion of which comes from unchecked dumping of human sewage from uh, local villagers uh, moreover industrial discharge into water bodies is also proved toxic to aquatic life uh contaminants like um heavy metals and chemical toxins can also affect many ecosystems lastly um agricultural contaminants like fertilizers have also further contributed to water pollution in pakistan causing eutrophication of water bodies eutrophication is essentially the rapid growth of algal blooms in water bodies which creates competition for oxygen with fish and other marine uh, organisms uh, over to iman now Okay so now I'll be talking about the biosphere. The biosphere is the part of the earth where air, water and soil and life are found. It consists of ecosystems which are made of both biotic which are living and abiotic elements. Due to the reckless cutting of trees many animals lose their homes thus causing a reduction in biodiversity leading to species extinction. Habitat fragmentation which is the breakup of large habitats into smaller parts can also take place causing an adverse effects on the ecological footprint. When land is cleared for agriculture or housing it causes many habitats uh, many habitats to lose their homes in turn leading to the extinction of many endangered species such as hyenas and stags in Pakistan 
The biosphere also consists of food chains involving the transfer of energy from one trophic level to another. Many interconnected, interconnected food chains form the food web. Due to overpopulation, the food web can also be adversely affected and its natural balance can be disrupted. For example, uh, as the human population increases, there would be a higher demand for animals such as chickens and cows and fish for humans to eat. Since the world is interconnected and humans aren't the only ones who eat these animals, it would increase competitiveness between the humans and other animals such as tigers, lions, foxes, etc. who also eat these animals. Animals. In simpler terms, overpopulation can cause an unbalance in the ecosystem and causes some animals to be deprived of food sources. This can result in two outcomes. Either the species is forced to leave their natural habitat and starts migrating to another area in search for food or it could die of starvation. Now we will talk about the solutions. Okay, so the solutions for the biosphere and lithosphere include of reforestation programs. An example of the reforestation program is KPK's Billion Tree Program, which was initiated in 2015. This will, uh, this will help solve problems associated with soil erosion, global warming, etc. In addition to that, there should be more focus on sustainable agricultural processes, such as using or organic fertilizers and reducing the use of genetically modified crops. Moreover, no tillage practices should also be implemented alongside polycropping, which is growing different crops together in order to increase the amount of nutrients in the soil. Apart from that, agroforestry can also be carried out where uh, trees are grown alongside crops, this way, the trees' uh, leaves, when they fall onto the ground, will uh, produce hummus, which will provide nutrients to the crops. In addition to that, we can also use renewable energy resources instead of fossil fuels, such as wind power and solar power, in order to uh, reduce the environmental impact. Now, over to Anam. Um, so, uh, in order to, the solutions for atmospheric pollution would be uh, green transport, for example, uh, electric cars or cycles which reduce pol uh, pollution um, secondly renewable resource energy resources again uh, like uh, solar and wind power because the other fossil fuel uh, the combustion causes pollution and uh, thirdly uh, using putting up air filters in pollution hotspots for example parking lots etc uh, now over to amen um okay so uh in order to recover um, what is left of uh, the hydrosphere in Pakistan, firstly, on the part of the government, a sound national water policy framework could be established. This water policy could manage the conservation of uh, water resources by um, checking industrial and agricultural um, discharge and improve the nation's water supplies by establishing adequate sewage facilities, um, something that could target the water pollution in our country. Um, in addition to this, Pakistan is home to at least 60 lakes, including Asia's largest freshwater lake. However, as many as 14 species of fish in these lakes have become extinct, this is, um, this is very alarming and therefore Pakistan needs to restore its rich biodiversity and water supplies in the hydrological cycle by restoring lakes. Uh, again, something that would need some government assistance to carry out on a larger scale. Another practice to help the diminishing um, water supplies in the country would be to regulate the tube well drilling. This is an extremely common practice in Pakistan and it needs to be checked in order to help recover the water table. Moreover, our uh, groundwater levels could also be artificially um, enhanced and artificially recharged in order to uh, increase the water table and hence um, uh, improve um, uh, the, water quality, the water levels in Pakistan. Um, thank you very much. Any questions can be uh, asked in the Q&A um, session. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Can you guys see this? Yes. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So, hello, everyone. So, today I'm going to be presenting on the Chernobyl disaster and its implications for the future of nuclear energy. Uh, so what happened was that in 1986, in the city of Perpath, the Soviets were using the RBMK nuclear reactor to produce energy. And they wanted to carry out a test in which they would determine how long turbines would supply power. Unfortunately, while doing this, the workers shut down two safety devices, which caused explosions. Uh, now these two explosions did two things. They exposed the core of the nuclear reactor as it wasn't in a properly in proper containment vessel. And two, it spread the radiation from the reactor all over the surrounding areas, making the, what is now known as the exclusion zone. So before we get into the effects, let's, let's establish what went wrong. So the blame for the incident lies in two areas. Uh, 
the design of the RBM can nuclear reactor, which was missing the containment structure. Now the containment structure is an, an absolute fail safe as the Fukushima Daiichi disaster proved, but it would have really lessened the spread of radiation in Chernobyl. Uh, moving on to the human aspect. Now appointing human blame for a disaster dislodge is to an extent unfair, but uh, the Soviets decided to throw six people in jail for it. So anyways, what little research I did find about this pointed to the plant that workers at Chernobyl weren't exactly well trained or even knew the key characteristics of the plant, but the plant also wasn't designed with people in mind. Uh, when you put these two elements together, it basically seems like Chernobyl was an accident waiting to happen. So what happened next? And the effects can be sorted between human and environmental. The extent of the human effects is tricky and has changed greatly over time. So initially it was believed that only some 31 people died from radiation and only about 116,000 had to be evacuated. But when the effect of cancer was explored, uh, the, death, the death toll rose to about 4,000. Uh, the effects weren't limited to humans though. The environment of what is now known as the exclusion zone suffered greatly and won't be habitable until around 2065. Areas as far as East Europe also experienced increased radiation. Apart from surface contamination, wildlife suffered greatly too, which strange mutation and lowered reproductivity. But as time passed, they recovered quickly due to the lack of human activity there. Now, Chernobyl was one of the worst things to happen to humans, all because of cheap energy. But if it's so, in a, but if it's so dangerous, why is it still used? For that, let's look at some of the pros and cons of nuclear energy. Now, nuclear energy is cheap, reliable, and creates a large amount of jobs as well as develops infrastructure. Aside from that, its carbon footprint is relatively very low, and the chances of disaster, such as Chernobyl and Fukushima, are very rare. But there are cons of it too. Costs of setting up a nuclear power plant are extremely high, and they only continue to grow. Also, the job aspect I mentioned before is only for a limited time as only very highly skilled workers will, re will remain after the construction is complete, causing unemployment. Also, while disasters are rare, they, also, they are also incredibly destructive and cost a lot to clean up, as you guys can see here. So now that we've established that nuclear energy is not our best option, we're, I'm going to discuss some brief, uh, some alternatives. Uh, I won't be going over fossil fuels as the world is already trying to move away from them. Now, solar energy may be clean and sustainable, but it is also highly inefficient. So it couldn't cater to our growing needs in the world. Wind energy is a, an ideal alternative as it is an efficient and sustainable but its production is both circumstantial and expensive due to battery storage when the wind isn't blowing. Uh, the third option is hydroelectric power, which is again natural and highly efficient, but it's already being used to its full extent as sites have to be provided by nature. Um, however, places which have not extracted its full potential such as Pakistan should do so without before moving on to other sources such, uh, such as nuclear energy. So yeah. In conclusion, the events of Chernobyl pro proved that nuclear energy is not mankind's best option. Yet for the time being, we do not really have the resources to move away from it completely. Uh, thank you. And am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, great. So the topic I chose was environmental migration, and I thought of this little um, catchy headline for it, which was seeking refuge from an intangible but deadly enemy, because I literally thought this was how it is, right? Like you, you can't really tell what the problem is, but it's essentially all around you. And which is why I thought this was actually an interesting topic to go ahead with as well. And I think one of my biggest um, fears while taking up this topic was deciding how I'm going to structure it, right? Because the topic was in itself so broad and there was a number of things you could look at within it. So I decided to structure it in three ways. And I decided to look at firstly, the global perspective on the issue. Secondly, how it's addressing Pakistan and essentially what impacts it has had on Pakistan, what has been its significance in Pakistan. And lastly, just this, uh, I mean, there was this really important factor for me because there's something that hit very close to home. I was personally um, 
familiar with someone who had been a victim of environmental damage and because of that they had to migrate and um uh, there's uh, i i basically talked to that individual and i added a little struck uh, i added a little section about her and my interaction with her as well so i'd like to dive into that a bit as well and lastly i'm going to be talking about the solutions that i found while uh, doing all of this research i looked at a number of reports and i looked at a number of united nations um reports as well which helped me come to a conclusion about what the best way would be to tackle this problem right so um essentially environmental migration is when individuals have to be displaced from their homes either permanently or temporarily because of changes in the environment and so far we've seen that there are um, two kinds of environmental damage that contribute to this migration number one you have the slow onset factors and secondly the sudden onset ones so sudden onset ones are for instance um damages like floods damages like cyclones which have a very um urgent impact on you right and then there's uh in the slow onset ones you have for example desertification sea levels rising which generally tend to have an impact over a longer period of time and in essence both of these have a very important role to play in environmental migration but when it comes to the global perspective i looked at it from four different regions so i firstly looked at the country that is most impacted by this problem which was afghanistan and over here we saw that recently the highest number of out migrants has been from afghanistan because you had very high rates of erosion you've had droughts in the country you've had water shortages and that's primarily and this was something that one of the ministers said right they said that this is because you have such a high lack of investment in sustainable technology like dams that you won't be able to control this problem even for years to come unless you come to a possible solution right but second yeah there's something i found very interesting because i thought we talked about it in class as well and this was the example of india where we already in 2017 saw the mumbai floods which took place and had a very great impact which led to a lot of people migrating out of india then secondly the entire idea of unplanned urban growth uh, the idea that india has been industrializing so rapidly in order to improve its economy that it's often overlooked environmental factors right but i think that just the most important factor here was me was the idea of the bhopal incident and i've tried to mention that in my report as well because after that incident took place and after the leak of the harmful gases you literally saw so many people migrating out of the area because one environmental damage was literally going to change the lives of generations to come right and that i thought was very very significant in this example as well thirdly i looked at africa where i where um, obviously aside from just the environmental damage that has taken place i thought one very interesting example i read up over here was the idea of whether africa whether it's even morally okay for africa to be bearing the brunt of this problem given that it has contributed the least to the problem of climate change to the problem of environmental damage and essentially i thought this was a very interesting twist to the idea as well right and i'm not going to um repeat a lot of the environmental factors because they've been very similar throughout most of these regions so and i think that's been uh, better covered in the report so i don't want to give up any um re re repeated details right but lastly uh when i looked at the uh european concept here there was one very interesting concept that, uh, one very interesting thing that i noticed which was that um universally you have like in, in especially in most countries in africa there is this convention known as the kampala convention so in this you basically recognize that climate change is a man made disaster and the displacement that it is causing is something that needs to be addressed on a humanitarian level as well right and i was very interested in seeing that there is no such convention being adopted within um yeah and i thought this was pretty cool because this is one of the most progressive countries in the world one of the most progressive continents in the world that doesn't recognize uh, climate change or environmental disasters to be a man made concept right and i think that is one of the reasons why you didn't see a lot of advancements or a lot of attention being paid towards the issue of um environmental migration and that's and this is a very um brief summary of a lot of the research that i did but i didn't want to bore you guys with a lot of detail um moving on to the national perspective over here i uh, looked specifically at the issue of environmental migration in pakistan and what uh, factors contributed right so essentially the problems that we have in pakistan because of this are uh, uh, that lead to this are floods heat waves torrential rain, rains changes in rain pattern sea erosion loss of arable land and i thought that the most important thing to consider here was that um this is one of the most major players in um the entire issue of rural urban migration that we have in pakistan 
So the high rates of people moving into cities like Lahore, Karachi, Islamabad to essentially find opportunities and live a better life is very highly contributed to by this factor, right? And this is where you also, and I thought this is very interesting because it's, in a, it's a cyclical concept, right? You have environmental damage in a rural area. People move out of those areas to into an urban area. And as a result of that, you have even more environmental damage. How? In the form of urban sprawls, when there's a greater ecological footprint, when there's a higher burden on natural resources, when all of those have to be divided amongst a greater population, right? And I thought that in Pakistan specifically, what I figured out was that the, this problem is basically occurring because of, a number one, a lack of investment into sustainable technology. So not having enough green technology that you can encourage companies and um, organizations to take up. Secondly, not investing enough into um, new irrigation systems, right? So we don't have a lot of investment into uh, drip irrigation, for example. We're sticking to more conventional methods that use up a lot of water, especially in our agricultural sector. Secondly, I thought that another problem we, we have in Pakistan is the lack of enforcement of policies. So the fact that we have had a, a universal car carbon cap being uh, imposed on us, but we haven't st been sticking to it. We've allowed um, big companies to lobby themselves out of uh, um, fines and lobby themselves out of policies being enforced on them was another major factor because these big companies like Coke, Nestle, all of whom are very, very responsible for the problem of environmental pollution can essentially get away just by bribing the government or by using their contacts, right? And lastly, I thought the problem was a lack of support for victims of environmental damage. And over here, I thought that it was like generally the concept is, okay, so if you lose your house in a flood, it's not really the government's responsibility. Like they can help you if they're feeling really generous, but it's not an outright law for them to um, sort of reach out to you and protect you, right? I thought there was a greater attention that needed to be uh, placed on this matter as well. Lastly, the personal perspective. So the, and this is why I'm going to talk about one of my interactions that I've had. So uh, I think about sometime in April or May, my grandmother hired a new a domestic uh, help, right? So her name was, Rubina, and when we talked to her and we tried to understand, okay, so like, where, where are you from? What happened? Where, where's your gown and all of that? We understood that her family had to move out because her father was working at a, a wheat farm for someone, for, for one of the landlords. And because of the uh, locust swarm that took place a couple of uh, months ago, there was a huge threat to their farm in terms of whether they would be able to produce enough sustainably or not, right? or whether they'd be able to meet their expenses. But the second problem was that due to torrential rains that happened the, the, at the start of this year, the wheat crop was actually destroyed. And there's something you would see on the news as well a lot, because I heard, because we all saw that there were a couple of farms and there were a couple of landlords who lost their incomes because of this, and their family was one of the victims of this attack, right? And because of that, they had to move into an urban area. They moved to Lahore, their entire family kind of dispersed in order to find a uh, new means of income. And I thought that was pretty interesting, and it kind of prompted me to understand this um, entire topic on a greater level as well. But uh, lastly, and I think I'm going a bit over time, so I'm quickly going to wrap up, is what uh, I figured out would be the solutions to this, right? And I thought essentially this was going to be a two-pronged mechanism. Number one, you control the factors that cause this problem. And number two, how you mitigate the effects once this problem has occurred. And for the first one, I thought it was important to look at policy creation and implementation. You need to impose fines. You need to make sure your carbon caps are being followed. You create better infrastructure for conserving water, for storing water. You move to desalination techniques. Thirdly, you shift to organic agricultural practices, right? So fertilizers that cause eutrophication on such a great level should be minimized. I mean, the use should be minimized to a great degree. And lastly, having awareness campaign. So it's very important to inform your people via hazard maps, for example, that you're living too close to a flood prone area. You shouldn't live near this area just to make sure that the impact impact of in the environmental damage isn't as great, right? But secondly, just understanding, and this is when the problem has occurred, right? So once you, this uh, kind of environmental migration has taken place, how do you address it then? And over here, you need to, number one, recognize that these victims of environmental damage are actual victims. So environmental problems are an actual thing that your government needs to cater to. So you have better relief and aid packages for them. You have a tracking system in order to ensure that if someone is taking a temporary movement out of their house because their house has been destroyed, you should encourage them to, okay, so after these many months, we expect you to have raised enough to go back to your area. Because otherwise, we won't be able to deal with the problem of urban sprawls or overconsumption. And essentially, I thought this was, um, uh, I mean, this is about it. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. But uh, yeah, so this is about it for my presentation.
Uh, hello, so uh, is the screen visible? Yes, uh, hello, is. guys, is the screen visible? Yes, but it's visible. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, hi, guys, uh, me and Nadeen, we will be presenting on um, the Kuwaiti oil fires of in 1991. Um, so, um, okay, so the background to this was that in 1990, a, a, Iraq under Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and annexed it after, um, after being unable to resolve an oil dispute with Kuwait. Now, uh, UN Resolution 678 passed on the 29th November gave Iraq a deadline of 15 January 1991 if they, if they did not withdraw they would be invaded. So a 35 nation coalition was gathering in Saudi Arabia at this time, codename Operation Desert Shield. And uh, when the deadline passed, they launched a devastating aerial bombardment campaign. It was during this time that the first fires were set up and following the, uh, and following the uh, ground invasion on the 24th February, the number of fires increased exponentially. As you can see, here are some photos of the uh, fires. Now, um, what, are, what were the uh, causes behind the fires? Now, uh, there were two major motivations, the military factor and the political economic revenge factor. So uh, regarding the military factor, it was hoped that with the setting up the fires, it would, um, act, it, the smoke plumes would give cover to, um, we would, would add like a blanket to cover the um, Iraqi positions from the, uh, from the uh, aerial bombardment. And there was also so the idea that the heat and the pollutants generated would act as an area of denial towards uh, the uh, coalition advances. Now, uh, this idea makes sense because um, during the, when the ground war started, uh, Iraqi sappers um, dug special trenches connecting oil wells and oil lakes, they, they like floored the oil through those trenches and set them alight. And, um, and secondly, the oil fires escalation was also occurred, co occurred coincidentally with the, um, with the uh, Gulf, War, uh, Gulf oil spill, which is the largest oil spill in history. Now, uh, the reason behind that oil spill was to prevent the landing from any Marines in in northern Kuwait, so it makes sense that there was a military factor involved. As for the uh, political economic revenge factor, keep in mind that, as I mentioned before, um, th that there was an issue with between um, oil production dispute between Iraq and Kuwait. Now, um, Kuwait had been producing oil at greater amounts than what they had been allowed to by OPEC. Iraq had already just come out of a devastating war with Iran and thus it needed money to um, improve itself. Now with the overproduction of oil, oil prices fell and as Iraq was dependent on the uh, production of oil for its economy, it, um, it, it faced bad economic troubles. Thus, um, uh, thus when the invasion happened and, and when the, um, and when the fires were started, it can be said that they were started out of revenge. And um, when they realized that they couldn't get, keep their hold on all the oil resources, they set a light. This is, they set them a light. If Iraq can't have Kuwaiti oil, no one can. And um, however, when coalition forces arrived to take care of the fires, they were unable to do so because A, the lands, uh, uh, lands around the oil wells were mined. So um, they could not uh, enter those areas. And secondly, they, did, they lacked suitable equipment and firefighting machinery to put a stop to the fires. Now, uh, coming to the effects of the fires, I will be discussing uh, military and economic effects. So, um, so now the uh, aerial plumes created by the uh, fires allowed Iraqi forces to win a victory in the uh, Battle of Phase Line Bullet against American forces. And uh, although it occurred after the war, on 
first of March, nineteen ninety-one, a Saudi Air Force plane carrying a Senegalese military detachment crashed while on approach to landing. Um, out of the uh, ninety-six aboard, uh, ninety-two of them were killed. And um, it is also it has been speculated that uh, the uh, fires, the pollutant from the fires, were the cause of the mysterious disease known as Gulf War Syndrome. Symptoms include cognitive dysfunction, diarrhea, muscular pain, PTSD, among others. Now the causes are yet to be established, but uh, there is a number, a large number of speculation that the resulting pollution from these oil fires were the cause of this of uh, this uh, disease. As for the economic effect, um, according to uh, Tahir Hussain, um, who an uh, economist based in Kuwait. Uh, it was speculated that it was thought that around 5 million barrels of oil a day were being lost as a result of the fires. Now, this is particularly devastating when you remember the fact that Kuwait too is, um, is a state that for its revenues is highly dependent on the export of oil. Eventually, the Kuwaiti government contracted several construction and firefighting companies such as Bechel, Safety Boss, Boots and Coots, and um, they got to work extinguishing the oil fires. The last well was extinguished in November 1991. Now uh, I would like to call upon Adeen to discuss the environmental and health effects in greater details. Uh, over to you, Adeen. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we hear you, Adeen. Uh, hello? Adeen, we hear you. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. We've come a long way from where we began. Oh, I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. That is so sweet. Thank you, ma'am, for your time, dedication, and what, and and all the things that you have done so far in this post. Quack, 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 I mean, I was, I, I couldn't, I was quite overwhelmed to offer the course because I hadn't done anything like this before. And then to do it in, in, in a virtual setting was, I think, tough because I was doing it for the first time. So if, um, I know I make a lot of faces and I flick my hair a lot and, and I clicked a lot sometimes, but that wasn't intentional. I didn't want to annoy you or anything. It was just purely, um, 
purely because I wasn't trained to do this. And this was my first time. And, and I know it has been overwhelming for you as well. I, I, could, I, I was getting emails and texts all the time say, you know, no, to hear that you have like 10 things due or, or four or five things due in the week. I'm sure it was tougher for you than it was for me. So thank you for coming to the class, for speaking, for staying and for participating and for giving amazing assignments and for everything and for, and for enrolling in this class because I thought no one would enroll in this class. They'd say, who's, who's Fawaz? Yeah, <laughs> we don't want to study this. So thank you. And uh, thank you for this as well. I think I'll record it and I'll, I don't know, I have to put it somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in, 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 the, in the virtual world for the world to see how cool my students were. And, uh, and yeah, and I'm going to miss you all. So on Saturday, I look forward to seeing you again. And uh, thank you for this little surprise. Um, and I don't know, I'm a little emotional, so I don't know what else to say. But you, I think you can, <laughs> I think you can go home <laughs> and enjoy like a nice dinner with your family. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ma'am. Allah is. Allah is. Thank you, ma'am. Allah is. Thank you, boss. Thank you, boss. You're the boss. <laughs> Thank you, man. Love is, ma'am. Love is, guys. Um, uh, ma'am.